Music City Comics, Episode 2, The Motherless Oven. Hello everyone, and welcome to Episode 2 of Music City Comics, your number one podcast for creator-owned and lesser-known comic books and graphic novels. Today I do not have a special guest, but I am joined by this fine, frosty, gluten-free, new grist, pilsner-style beer. And it is fine. Alright, so we're going to try something different than the first episode, and we're definitely going to use less spoilers this time. Yeah, yeah, that's what we're going to do. We're going to try to make this as spoiler-free as possible while still telling you guys a gist of the story. Today we're going to be talking about the motherless oven. The Motherless Oven was published by Self Made Hero in 2014, and it was written and illustrated by Rob Davis. Rob Davis is a British comic artist and writer who has worked for Doctor Who magazine, and he has also written an adaptation of Don Quixote for Self Made Hero. You might also know him from his work in the Lovecraft Anthology, Volume 1, for the story The Dunwich Horror. The Motherless Oven is about a boy named Scarper Lee who is swiftly approaching his death day, and I'll get to that a little bit later. He meets Vera Pike, who is very interested in Scarper's mysterious and enormous father. Once again, I'll get to that later. When Scarper's father escapes, him and Vera enlist a boy named Castro, no relation, to help find him. This takes them on a sprawling adventure across this weird world which Rob Davis has masterfully written. Rob Davis uses a couple unique qualities in his story. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the world of the motherless oven. The first one, which is very apparent, is the use of the weather clock. The weather clock is the elected ruler of this land. It also can determine whether it's sunny, rainy, snowy, or if it's going to be raining knives that day. That's how the story opens up, is with a huge knife storm. And if that's not interesting enough, Televisions have been replaced by a television wheel, which is more or less just a gear that spins over and over again on the TV that per portrays a story. Every day, the television wheel gets switched out, because that's the law, and gets replaced with another one, which tells a whole new story for a whole new day. Appliances, well, simple appliances such as radios and egg timers, are replaced by idols, which are little statues of people who perform these tasks for you. For example, some idols will sing songs for you, specifically the song Alibi Lullaby by Ernest Berry, and other ones will just keep on ticking until they don't need to tick anymore. The interesting thing about these idols, though, is that it's kind of alluded to that they do have some sentience and are a little bit alive while still being part machine. As I mentioned earlier, Scarper Lee has a death time. In this world, as soon as someone is born, they're told their death day. The death day is the day in which they will die. Surprise! Now, how that death occurs and what exactly happens was not told in this volume. It is very interesting to think that that would be a predetermined date that everybody would have. To help Scarper deal with his approaching death day, the school guidance counselor gives him a home gazette. A home gazette is a lot like a personal recorder that's in the shape of a pot. The guidance counselor gives this to Scarper because she thinks that he's going to need to talk to someone during his final days, and with mothers and fathers being the way that they are, he needs something that will actually speak back. The mothers and fathers are a very interesting characteristic of this story because they're not exactly human. Rather, they're a whole modge podge of stuff, including lamps, monstrous creatures, abstract art, vehicles, all sorts of stuff. Some of them are just homebodies, some of them people can ride, some of them have a lot of functionality, and some of them are just can make up the citizens of this town. The idea of a mother or father based off of strange appliances is nothing new to Rob Davis, who in 2010 wrote a short comic story in The Observer titled How I Built My Father. The story basically is about a boy who gets a lot of bits and pieces together and makes his father in the shape of basically a giant sailboat. Based off the description that Scarper gives his father in this story, you can tell that Rob Davis is playing off of his idea a little bit more. Besides those characteristics, there's also a lot to be said about the dialogue that Rob Davis uses. I would say it's something sort of between, I would say it's almost similar, I would say it's almost akin to a clockwork orange in the sense that it makes up words that you can understand in context and would make sense if somebody said them in a regular sentence. However, they're a little bit off. I'm not going to spoil that though, you have to read it to really embrace this dialogue for what it is. 
The story is written in a way that every character has their own voice and never really strays from who they are. Although it is sort of a coming-of-age story and the characters do develop, there is a lot to be said for the consistency in the characters' tones and dialogue throughout the story. The world in this story, besides just the characteristics which I mentioned earlier, is a sprawling environment that makes you want to sink your teeth in even more. There's so much mystery about how it got the way it was, if it was always like that, where the mothers and fathers come from, all kinds of details that you want to know about. And the use of the mothers and fathers as a plot devices and what Rob Davis chooses to do with them later in the story is very interesting. When it comes down to narration in the story, Rob Davis chooses the home gazette, which I mentioned earlier, instead of normal text boxes. The scenes are usually narrated or rehashed, with Scarper lying on the ground listening to what his home gazette has recorded him saying during the day, which is a very effective tool for saying exactly what's going on even without showing it. As Scarper, Vera, and Castro explore this mysterious land, they also run across the antagonists of the story, aka the police, which are composed of senior citizens with guns. Now, those senior citizens themselves might not sound too terrifying to some people. What the author says they do to the children that they arrest sounds extremely unpleasant. If you want to know what that is, you'll have to read the story, won't you? And you should, because it's worth a read. It's hard for me to talk about this story and do it justice. It is a visceral high-concept tale into the mind of an extremely talented author as he takes you for a ride that you will not forget. Now, the story itself on the spine doesn't say Volume 1, and it doesn't end in a to-be-continued. However, Rob Davis retweeted me after I read this story and told me that he is currently working on a second volume, and I personally cannot wait. Alright, so the art in this book. The art uses heavy lines to outline all of the objects and the characters, which I can really appreciate, and then every character gets their own individual characterization. For example, Scarper has dark hair and dark eyebrows. Vera's hair sets her apart from all the, char all the other characters. And Castro, the only black character in the story, is always wearing headphones, which are supposed to help him keep his brain on straight. All of these variances in appearance are extremely necessary in this story, because for most of the story, the characters are all wearing the same school uniforms. All the children are. The shading all has a nice watercolor look in varying darknesses, as the book is black and white. However, much like the actual unique looks of every object and person, they also do a great job of giving more character to the story. And based on the story itself, it's not hard to picture the tale being in black and white. The buildings in many of the backgrounds are undescript, although you can always tell where they are. However, it's in the mothers and fathers that the author really excels. Some truly do look like a piece of abstract art you would find at the MoMA, while some of them look like monsters straight out of a dark Jim Henson movie. The television wheel, which I discussed a little bit earlier, is drawn with strange geometric patterns and usually people surrounding it, which gives a glimpse into the world of entertainment in the motherless oven. You can tell while reading and looking through this story that Rob Davis went to extreme lengths to make sure that the ideas that he had came out as accurately as possible on the paper. All in all, this is a story that will make you think, and will make you constantly want to know more about this world, and when the story's over, that feeling does not go away. I'm exceedingly excited about Volume 2, though I'm not sure when it's going to come out. If you can pick this up, then I absolutely guarantee you do so. It's a soft cover book that's 1995. However, you know you can probably find it online for much cheaper than that. Definitely check it out if you want a visceral, open-ended, intense, mind-blowing, ingenious story from a very, very smart author. Before we wrap up here, I just want to mention a couple of graphic novels that will be coming out in the first half of February. First is Punk's Git Cut. That's Git with an I by J. Powell. This is published by Last Grasp, and contains reprints of Powell's zines and books. From Image Comics, Outcast, written by Walking Dead's Robert Kirkman, and artist Paul Azaceta, tells the story of a boy trying to discover the secret behind the possessions that have constantly plagued him during his life. And then from first second, we have The Sculptor, written by Scott McCloud. The Sculptor is about a sculptor that gets the ability to sculpt anything he wants after a deal with death, but will die after 200 days. Lots of interesting stuff is coming out, obviously, but let's just touch on those for now. As I mentioned in the last podcast, you can reach me at musiccitycomics at gmail.com or on Twitter at JustDrewVG. If you like what you heard today, then you should also check out musiccitycomics.blogspot.com where I go over a new series that deserve much more attention and old series that did not withstand the test of time. 
Thanks again for joining me today, and I will see you guys in two weeks. See you next time.